You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, listeners should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Individuals should not enter into an options transaction until they have read and understood the disclosure document, characteristics, and risks of standardized options. Available by visiting the OCC.com or by contacting your broker. Any exchange on which options are traded or the Options Clearing Corporation at 125 South Franklin Street, number 1200, Chicago, Illinois, 60606. The Options Industry Council is an industry resource provided by the Options Clearing Corporation, collectively OCC. Any strategies discussed are strictly for illustrative and educational purposes only and are not to be construed as an endorsement or solicitation to buy or sell securities. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of several resources investors can utilize to learn more about options. Other resources OIC offers include webinars, articles, and self-guided options-related coursework. For more information, check out www.optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Benzaquin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OIC's Wide World of Options. I'm your host, Mark Benzaquin. For October, OIC has a pair of webinars lined up to shed some light on two topics that have entered into the investing zeitgeist as of late, those being zero DTE and the rise of volume for ETFs and indices. And to help shed that light, I'm very excited to welcome Mr. Dan Passarelli of Market Taker Mentoring. Dan, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Dan, do me a favor. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Why don't you take a moment and tell us a little bit about yourself, about Market Taker Mentoring, and your involvement and experience in options. Sure. So uh, I'm Dan Passarelli. I started down on the trading floor well, kind of a long time ago, um, as a runner, and which is basically the most entry-level position you can get, and um, worked my way up to becoming a trader, became one of the biggest traders in my pit at uh, the height of my trading career on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And um, then since leaving the trading floor, I've sort of dedicated my life to kind of giving back to the community and helping other traders reach their goals. So I started Market Taker Mentoring in 2008, and we've trained traders in over 50 countries, trained tens of thousands of traders. I don't know. I kind of lost count. Excellent. Uh, and, and education is so important, uh, especially for today's class of trader that um, is certainly a different class than when you and I were in the business, when you and I were getting started in the business, I should say. Um, so when it comes to that education, as I had mentioned uh, in the introduction, one of the buzz topics is, you know, you're very familiar with is uh, zero days to expiration, commonly known as zero DTE. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with the giant elephant in the room, right? Uh, namely how zero DTE is technically a misnomer. So let's get started. Tell us why you think that is. Yeah. So what zero DTE is, is there's 
zero days till expiration. The option expires today. Well, I mean, if you think about it, <laughs> that's it's always been the case. It's just that it used to be once a month. Uh, if, you know, when expiration day came along, there's zero DT for that name. Uh, but then, of course, we went to weeklies and uh, you know subweeklies and all that. And now it's a little bit you know, more ubiquitous. Right, right. So the zero DTE technically has been in existence as long as options have been in existence. It really is just trading options on the day they expire. Um, and as you had mentioned before, when we just had monthly contracts or quarterlies or end of the month, you know, when there were just a few expiration cycles, that day of expiration was known as zero DTE. Now, with the proliferation of weeklies and, in some cases, daily expirations, um, the the concept of trading on that day of expiration has uh, definitely grown in terms of popularity. I've got some statistics uh, that were uh, curated by Henry Schwartz of the CBOE. So, for example, with stocks, and this may not be actually zero DTE, but these are more short-term options versus long. So, with stocks, for example, contracts expiring less than a week to go, uh, average uh, average daily volume of about twenty seven and a half, I'm sorry, twenty four and a half million contracts per day versus uh, contracts expiring more than a week out uh, is about twenty one and a half million. So, the shorter term, less than a week. Um, at least 10% greater average daily volume than the longer term. With ETFs, it's even uh, more of a disparity. ETFs, less than a week to go, about 12 million average daily volume versus 6 million more than a week. Uh, and then indices, uh, 2.5 million less than a week, 1.6 million more. So it's showing that more people are trading these shorter term expiries, whether they be you know shorter term weeklies or specifically zero DTEs. Um, also by Henry Schwartz in 2016, zero DTEs accounted for about 5% of the uh, total volume versus in 2024, it's over 20%. Um, less than a week to trade, about 46% of the total volume versus more than 30 days, it's about 74% of the total volume. And and I know that these numbers are confusing, but what they mean is more people not only are getting attracted to the options product, as we know by the increases in volume, but more people are getting attracted to these shorter term um, uh, these shorter term expiries. Now, my question to you, Dan, is how does that affect, for example, a retail trader? Right now, when we've got... Uh, a contract that we maybe we enter into today that is expiring today, at the end of the day, it's either going to be worth something or it's going to be worth nothing. Um, so how, what, in your opinion, what do you think traders need to look out for? Let's look at theta, for example, time decay. It's certainly going to affect a zero DTE contract much differently than, let's say, a 30-day. So uh, as a retail trader, what do you think they might want to look out for? What should they keep in their mind when trading these? Yeah, I mean, as far as what to look out for, some of the dangers, <clears throat> um, if we're going long options, just buying calls or buying puts, which is... One of the most common things that zero DT traders trade, the theta is a hundred percent. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, I actually feel that's kind of liberating. Um, I mean, I'm the guy who like loves to talk about the Greeks. Uh, that was my first book was on the Greeks. Like, you know, like they're such important instruments, but when it comes to zero DT trading, uh, the Greeks become very different. And just looking at theta, uh, per se, when we think about options, like I always think, okay, we look at the Greeks or we look at a P&L chart. Like the P&L chart just becomes so much more important. If I buy this call, is it going to move enough to, you know, to cover theta by the end of the day? I don't know. In some ways, I think that some of the things that you have to look out for are they they make trading a little easier when it comes to zero dts a, a little easier okay that's interesting that's an interesting take um so we're looking at it from the buyer's perspective and and a, a great point that you made if you're buying an option for you know x 
Um, you've got to make sure that that option gains enough in value to where it's profitable at the end of the day because theta is going to decay, as you had mentioned, 100%. If that option is out of the money and its premium is entirely represented by time value, come you know 3 o'clock or 3.15 central time for us Chicagoans, uh, that option is going to be worth zero. Uh, unless that stock moves enough, unless that uh, index moves enough to account for that uh, uh, that erosion of theta. Um, from the seller standpoint, that's got to be the good thing, though, right? Uh, so do you think zero DTE is more attractive to sellers as to buyers? Well, you know, Mark, that's always the tricky thing with options, isn't it? <laughs> whenever, you, whenever you get a benefit, you also get the opposite side of that. Right. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, when selling options, definitely. Like, it's great to have that theta because all the time premium gets sucked out by the end of the day. It becomes zero. But the other side of theta is gamma, which is almost kind of a weird thing to talk about with zero DTE options. It's it's relevant, but gamma kind of becomes infinite. Um, want me to... Yeah, explain that. expound, please. <laughs> explain what I'm thinking here. <clears throat> so, like, if you think about it, what like what does gamma measure? Like, when it comes down to it, delta and gamma just measure the the kind of the likelihood of the option expiring in the money. I mean, that's not necessarily mathematically correct, but it's kind of conceptually correct. And gamma just sort of changes the delta. But here's the deal. When it comes to zero DT options, at the end of the day, the delta is zero or 100. Right. Like, so, the, so the gamma is ultimately infinite or non-existent. You can kind of look at it whichever way you want. Like yeah. Gamma kind of doesn't matter. And delta is... The actual, to me, the actual mathematical value of delta becomes so much less important on expiration day because at the end of the day, it's zero or 100. It doesn't matter if it says 43 on the screen right now. We know it's going to be one of those two things. Right. Right. Um, so, so gamma, you think, is uh, depending on the, you know, how the investor looks at it, may or may not be something to concern themselves with, because as you had mentioned at the end of the day, that option's either worth something, it's got 100 deltas, or it's not worth anything, and it's got zero. Um, but I've got to imagine that due to the sensitivity of the option to the stock price or the uh, underlying index price, um, any changes in implied volatility has got to, uh, you know, really uh, make the investor's head spin, right? If, uh, you know, the market goes up, you know, a tick or two, now the option's in the money and it's worth something. If it goes down a tick or two, it's out of the money and it's worthless. Uh, any changes in implied volatility have got to be significant, no? You know, I, I would say yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, like when it comes down to it, on, a, on expiration day, zero DTE day, traders are trading, you know, they're buying or selling these options for, you know, they're, if, if it's directional, just to make some directional profit. If it's uh, credit spread to, you know, bring in some theta, a lot of theta. Um, but like the buying and selling pressure is what causes implied volatility to change from a classic sense. But at the end of the day, because there's no time premium left, that implied volatility only affects the time premium. <laughs> and so if a trader is willing to pay a nickel more on said options and the unit of Vega is like, you know, 0 0.001, well, okay, sure, the screen says implied volatility just rose 20 points, right. but did it? <laughs> yeah, I get that. Okay, all right, interesting. Um, let's say I put on a position six months ago, and now it's expiring today. Um, I'm trading out of that position by rolling it uh, a another month down the road. So today, there's that options volume that I did, right? I did a zero DTE trade. 
but uh, I, I'm not getting in and out of the position today. What I'm simply doing is uh, managing my position today and moving it further down the road. What uh, Do you have any insight on that uh, in terms of position management and how that accounts for volume in zero DTE or the interest in zero DTE? Yeah, um, we do a lot of work with zero DT. So I, you know, I'm always nerding out about the statistics and and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you look at like debit spreads, the statistics show that most of the debit spreads that trade are people closing credit spreads. Hmm. Um, you know, they're they're, they're ultimate closing positions. Um, there are more debit spreads. Um, that are closing positions and opening. But when it comes to uh, credit spreads, the other side of that, what we tend to see is people putting on credit spreads at the beginning of the day and just letting them go through expiration. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have no overnight risk, but I do want to clarify something that I like to bring up time and time again, is that when it comes to spread trading, whether it's a debit or credit spread, just because the position expires out of the money doesn't mean that your risk is gone. So you may not have that overnight risk, but you do have that aftermarket risk, specifically if we're talking about uh, you know, single stocks, for example. Um, so just uh, something to consider. Now uh, I want to shift gears. Um, let's talk a little bit more about ETFs and indices. Um, for those people that are new to options, how would you describe or what would you say is the uh, the primary differences between single stock options and ETFs or indices? Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking about this earlier. <clears throat> I mean, well, the obvious difference stems from the fact that an ETF or an index um, is a basket of securities. Mm-hmm. And when we look at the math behind baskets of securities, uh, what becomes interesting is that the 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 risk. uh, Well, I should say, let's use a better word. The volatility becomes smaller, um, maybe less sensitive. Yeah, less sensitive, less sensitive. Right. Because, you know, one security like it has a specific company news, a news specific to that company, whereas right. it gets smoothed out with the basket. So there's one there's one thing. Mm-hmm. And then obviously the the underlying, uh, you know, you, if you buy uh, a single stock option in you know XYZ, as you had mentioned, any news relating to XYZ is going to impact that option significantly if it's an ETF that has XYZ in its basket or if it's an indice or an index that has XYZ uh, as you had mentioned it's going to be you know smoothed out a little bit more um, other differences you know most indices are cash settled um, you know rather than physically with shares um, a lot of them are European exercise so you can only uh, exercise that contract on the day of expiration versus uh, American style which they can be exercised at any time um, but let's kind of build on what we were talking earlier with zero DTE and some uh, different data points um, average daily volume uh, in 2024 versus prior years, and this is something that I just saw, and and I thought it was really fascinating. Um, indices, for example, um, year over year growth last year versus this year about seven and a half percent, nearly 18 percent growth over the last five years. So the last five years, almost 20 percent growth uh, in indices, 13 percent growth over the last five years um, for. Uh, ETFs. And then speaking of ETFs, since 2020, I see that uh, listings of new ETFs have gone up by over 100%, 112%. One of the things I find interesting about ETFs, and this is something that, uh, uh, that somebody pointed out to me recently, is that there are people that can trade ETFs. Let's say you don't have your approval to trade options. Right. Uh, For those listening, if you do want to trade options, you need to be approved for an options trading account. Now, that's going to be different from a normal stock trading account. Um, So if you don't have options approval, there are certain ETFs that almost behave, uh, and Dan, I want your opinion on this, that almost behave similar to an option. 
um, right? There are uh, ET. There's leveraged ETFs now, um, inverse ETFs. So, what's your insight on that? Well, you know, Mark, I always, I always found inverse ETFs to be just kind of ridiculous. Like, <laughs> learn about puts. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I love it. You, what do you need that for? Uh, you know, um, I mean, or you could even just short the darn thing. But, you know, puts protect you. They give you uh, limited risk instead of unlimited risk. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I like that. Just, yeah, definitely more people are getting involved with those. Um, and we will be talking uh, more about ETFs and indices as well as zero DTE in our upcoming OIC webinar. So listeners, I uh, invite you to uh, tune in for that. Uh, in the meantime, Dan, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit with us. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, Great to be here. Yeah, it's always great to see you. Thank you. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for today's episode of Wide World of Options. Again, special thanks to our friend Dan Passarelli, Market Taker Mentoring. Um, again, Dan, thanks for taking the time to sit with us, providing your insight into zero DTE and ETFs and indices. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back next time with a whole new show featuring more industry names, market concepts, and of course, trusted options education. In the meantime, be sure to visit the events section of our optionseducation.org website. Register for our upcoming webinar events. As I had mentioned, um, October is going to be zero DTE and ETF, so uh, make sure you register for, the, for those two um, episodes starring Matt Cashman, one of our favorite educators here at OIC. Uh, thanks again to all of our listeners and supporters out there. And as always, please feel free to send us your questions via email at options at the OCC.com or live chat with us on our website. Take care, everyone, and we'll be talking with you again very soon. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email options at the OCC.com or visit www.optionseducation.org and chat with OIC's Investor Education Team. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Subscribe to the OIC YouTube channel, like them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter at options.edu, and follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. <laughs>